Have you ever heard of a happy little prison town? Kind of sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Well, sort of like how plants can grow in the cracks of concrete, economic development can happen in the most unexpected places. That's what happened in Susanville, California, where an entire town's economy revolves around a prison. A few weeks ago, our friends over at the Young Turks talked about the consequences of closing this prison in this small California town. Residents of Susanville are bracing for the worst as it's going to shut down, right? Because it's not just about the prison shutting down, it's about the business that's provided to small businesses in the area. Scores of for sale signs, for instance, have popped up on front lawns. Owners of restaurants and hotels, which rely on inmates' Visitors fear business could plummet. School leaders are bracing for families with children leaving, which could lead to a cut in the school's funding. So it has this domino effect. And it's not that the community is in favor of how the justice system is playing out right now or how, um, you know, we imprison more people than, you know, most other developed countries. They just don't know what they're going to do economically once it shuts down, which again, is why I think Biden needs to make a stronger case for a federal jobs guarantee. So Anna Kasparian's solution to this problem is a federal jobs guarantee. I suppose this could be a lesson in how we all kind of retreat to our priors in response to new information. Anna looks at this, a story about a government facility closing and leaving a community behind, and she thinks that this is a good reason for why we need more people employed by the government. I look at this and think, this is precisely the problem with viewing jobs as ends in and of themselves. The point of the economy is to create goods and services for people, not to create jobs. The point of the steel industry is to create steel, not create jobs in Pittsburgh. The point of the automobile industry is to create cars for people to drive, not create jobs in Detroit. The point of having prisons is to keep dangerous people away from the rest of society and hopefully rehabilitate them, though we're not very good at that last part. It's not to economically support communities in Susanville, California. Don't get me wrong, I completely understand why these people are anxious about this prison closing. It's the economic backbone of their community. Everything revolves around it. Take it away and they won't have much of the town left. Most people would not want to see the place they live in suffer economic collapse. The solution, however, is not a federal jobs guarantee. There are a number of problems with such a policy, but this story highlights one of them more acutely than others. The moral hazard. When you view jobs as ends in and of themselves, and when you view it as the responsibility of politicians to make sure there are enough jobs for their constituents, you create a whole host of bad incentives. Anna thinks that politicians should help this town by opening a factory that produces some component for green energy infrastructure. Like the infrastructure uh, proposal from Biden. That can provide so many jobs. If you invest in renewable energies, maybe build a factory in this community uh, to build wind turbines and uh, you know solar, solar panels, whatever it is. There are actually solutions, but we're not having conversations about the solutions. We're having conversations about we're gonna shut it down and then we're gonna move on with our lives. And there are 8,000 people in this community who don't know what to do. Let's just say for the sake of argument that that's a good idea. That solar panels and wind turbines are something we actually need. If you're a politician and you want to make sure the community has jobs, wouldn't it just be easier to keep the prison open? The reason that prisons are being closed in California is because the prison population is declining. Assuming that this doesn't pose a threat to public safety, isn't that a good thing? As long as crime doesn't rise and all other things are equal, wouldn't you rather live in a state or a country with fewer inmates rather than more? Isn't a high prison population usually a sign of a poorly functioning society? California's prison population has plummeted in recent years for a number of reasons, one of which is the relaxation of penalties for violations of drug laws. This is something that the Young Turks and I both support. One of the problems is that you have a number of people, like the residents of Susanville, California, who are directly invested in the status quo. Of course, they're not the only ones. Police and prison guard unions have consistently opposed various forms of criminal justice reform, like drug decriminalization. And to their credit, TYT has criticized these people. Well, it turns out that police and prison guards are fighting aggressively against it, and they're working with their unions in order to fund politicians and also advertisements to defeat the ballot initiative. So, hey, if I'm in the prison uh, business, I want more prisoners. 
uh, so depressing. right or wrong, just or unjust, it, who cares? Uh, I need more prisoners. I need to make a buck, right? So if you want to know why they're not doing the most rational thing in the world, it, but once they start a program, people start making money off of it. Once mm -hmm. they start making money off of it, in our system, you can legally bribe politicians. And so you can say, here's your campaign donation, now you're hooked. And while I disagree with these vested interests, I understand where they're coming from. Would you take political action that would take away your job? Most people probably wouldn't. The fact that you have all of these different groups invested in the status quo makes reform all the more difficult. Now, I would never suggest that this is the only reason why drugs are not decriminalized in the United States. There are plenty of people who want drugs to be illegal for various reasons. But these groups have a direct, more immediate, financial interest in the issue are probably more likely to vote against reform than the general population, even if they believe reform is a good idea in theory. To better understand what I'm trying to get at here, I'm going to invoke a branch of economics known as public choice theory. The trade attorney Scott Linscomb describes this far better than I ever could. Public choice theory is a branch of economics developed by economists James Buchanan and Gordon Tulock and elucidated in their 1962 book, The Calculus of Consent. In general, public choice takes the same principles that economists use to analyze people's actions in the private market and applies them to people's actions in the public sphere. Thus, political actors are presumed to act not in the public interest, but in their own rational self-interest and thus use political systems in which they operate to make themselves not the general public or nation as a whole, better off. In this context, elected officials' primary goal is re-election, whereas bureaucrats strive to advance or protect their own careers. Surely, political actors have motivations other than self-interest, but the general public choice framework assumes the latter until proven otherwise. As Buchanan put it, the theory replaces romantic and illusory notions of the workings of governments with notions that embody more skepticism. If you accept this framework, which if you don't, I would love to hear your rebuttal, the stickiness of bad laws that have led to our over-incarceration problem seem to make a little more sense. Politicians have way more to gain by, say, keeping certain substances illegal, as do various constituencies, even if decriminalizing said substances is much better policy overall. Of course, it's not just drug laws. That just happens to be one of the operative factors in the specific case of Susanville, California. No, this dynamic that public choice theory lays out is operative in all sorts of bad policy as well as the implementation of good or necessary policies, from farm subsidies to tariffs and so much more. So, I'd love to ask Anna, or anyone else who supports a federal jobs guarantee, what is more likely to happen should we implement that policy? That bureaucrats, elected officials, and workers employed in these programs will judiciously do work that we desperately need, and that will benefit the country as a whole, and more importantly, stop that work if it is no longer necessary, or will these same people pursue their self-interests irrespective of what is good for the country? I have my answer. The thing is, TYT really does get the underlying logic behind public choice theory. Most people do. They're constantly talking about the rent-seeking nature of politicians and politically well-connected industries. They may discuss this more than any other show in online politics. This is the essence of their complaints about money in politics. They argue that politicians take money for their campaigns from wealthy donors and turn around and serve these donors with their legislating or lack thereof. So do I believe the rest of the people in the race will be greatly impacted by the millions of dollars that their big donors are giving them? Yes, I'm definitely worried about that. Well, and yes, you, you, I think they will bend to the corporate donors' will. Do you not think that? You think that all of them are angels and the millions of dollars they're going to get, they're going to be like, oh, I don't care about that. Oh, I, hey, I'm not going to run for re election. It's not like I'm going to want that money again. I've gone over why I think they overstate this many times and how they ignore other factors at play. But make no mistake, they are invoking the logic of public choice theory, whether they know it or not. Politicians, acting out of self-interest, serve a constituency that helped them get elected, rather than doing what is best for the public as a whole. More importantly, the Young Turks lack imagination in terms of how these political relationships emerge in the first place. They seem to think this is almost entirely a function of our current campaign finance regime. And once we eliminate private funding of elections in favor of public financing, most of these problems will just go away. Politicians will then listen to what their voters want, or what TYT imagines their voters want, and implement wise public policy, rather than cater to narrow special interests. 
I think they're horribly naive about this. But again, the point is that they understand political actors respond to incentives in a way that hurts the broader public. In fact, basically everyone gets that. I see all sorts of pro-government people here online talk about certain hazards of government policies in terms that public choice advocates would completely agree with. Then these same people will turn around and make the case for some new set of laws, regulations, or programs. It's a trend I've started to notice. People understand that political actors respond to narrow incentives when talking about them in the real world. Yet, when these same people advocate for their own politics, they assume that the officials implementing and administering their favored policies will be angels who are guided only by doing what is right within the confines of the stated objective of the law. In other words, when talking about public policy they don't like, people are realists. When talking about policies they currently support or would like to be realized, people are idealists. The Young Turks are a great example of this. As I said earlier, they're always talking about how politicians are only responding to donors instead of voters. That's why we get policies they don't like. Yet, they don't seem to realize that campaign donations can influence things they favor as well. Since the pandemic began, the Young Turks have generally favored government enforced mitigation efforts like mask mandates and lockdowns. Not in that they enjoyed these things, but in that they thought they were necessary for and effective at containing COVID-19. The problem is, incentives don't magically change during a pandemic. Consider this, there were always exemptions granted during the lockdowns. Essential businesses were supposed to keep their doors open. What's the definition of an essential business, though? Well, that determination was up to politicians. And when you put politicians in charge of the economy, do you think they're going to make economic decisions or political ones? There's actually good evidence to suggest that the governors of states that implemented lockdowns did the latter. A paper published at the end of April this year in the Journal of Political Institutions and Political Economy made some pretty bold suggestions regarding the reason why certain businesses were shut down and others weren't. The paper was titled Essential or Expedient, COVID-19 and Business Closures in the United States. The authors, political scientists Jesse M. Crossan and Srinivas C. Parinandi, apologies for butchering your name, sir, made the sort of claims you'd expect to hear on the Young Turks. These gentlemen found that there is some preliminary evidence that governors are more likely to consider a business subsector to be essential if they received campaign contributions linked to that subsector. In terms of quantifying the estimated influence of the gubernatorial campaign contributions variable on essential business declaration, the presence of the gubernatorial campaign contribution in the NAICS subsector leads to a roughly 10% increase in the probability that an industry within that subsector will be declared essential. NAICS stands for the North American Industry Classification System, which is a database used by federal statistical agencies in classifying business establishments for the purpose of collecting, analyzing, and publishing statistical data related to the U.S. business economy. In other words, it looks like politically well-connected businesses and industries were more likely to be exempt from lockdown orders. As is almost always the case with academic literature, Crossan and Paranandi are very cautious in the claims they made and the conclusions they drew from the data. I'm honestly surprised that this paper didn't get more traction in the conservative press, given that most of those outlets were more likely to be critical of lockdowns. Obviously, I know why TYT didn't cover it. It goes against their ideological agenda. But, more importantly, the mainstream press didn't cover it, so they couldn't make a derivative video on it. I sincerely hope that the coronavirus will soon be behind us, and that new variants don't inspire further lockdowns and policies like it. If you do support these policies, though, just remember, they're going to be implemented and enforced by political actors, who are most likely going to make political decisions. Mm.